Thank you so much, Mr. Nambani, and a very warm welcome to all our technical science students, teachers, and the house at large that will be writing tomorrow. Today, I'm going to present these topics. The reason why I have this picture here is because students forget that these topics are in this black book, which is organic chemistry and electrochemistry, which is paper two. So any questions, you will find them on page 60. Sorry, I don't know. You know. Okay. I always put the examination guideline for the benefit of the notes that we're going to share later on so that you have everything within one document. So I'm going to be dealing with all of these as we go along. So the first part of the work that I'm going to focus on is light itself. And in light itself, I'm going to look at the key concepts of reflection up until total internal reflection, as well as its uses. So let's get started. We have these two concepts here. So the first one is refraction and the second one is reflection. The moment there is blending of light, it is refraction. So if we look at these two doc, these two images in this document, you'll see that here there is a bending of light at this point. So that makes us know automatically that it's refraction. When the light is changing direction upon striking an interface between two materials, then it is a reflection. So it's very easy because if you get tomorrow a diagram that looks like this, then you automatically know that this is the law of reflection, law of reflection. So when it comes to reflection itself, you have your normal, um, I don't know whose mic is on there, sir. If you can just check on uh, Teams for me. Then you have your incident ray and your reflected ray. Now, mostly here, yeah, everybody knows these labels. What people confuse is where's the position of the angle. So the angle of incidence is between the normal and the ray, and the angle of reflection is between the normal and the reflected ray. So the law of reflection is saying that these two angles are equal to each other. Which two angles? The angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. That means that if this is 40 degrees, the angle of incidence, it means that also the angle of reflection will be 40. So if it increases, the angle of incidence increases, the angle of reflection will also increase and vice versa. The second concept that um, we can talk about in this topic is refraction. Now here I've got two different images which is showing the bending of light, but I chose these images specific because they are showing us two different scenarios. In the first diagram here, we have the incident ray going from water to air. And in the second diagram, we have the incident ray striking from air to water. So in scenario number one, light is moving from a dense medium because water is denser than air to a less dense medium. And in scenario two, it's the opposite. It is going from a less dense medium to an optically dense medium. This is going to affect what the image that you are going to see. If we compare these, you can see that the incidence ray, and this is the angle of incidence, then strikes this interface into air and what happens? Can you see here now that this angle of refraction has increased? So it because it's going to a less dense medium, it is going to travel much faster. So therefore you are going to have this larger refractive um, angle. Here it's the opposite. You can see that it's now going from air Right, and then it is going into water. So you can see that there is a reduction in the angle of refraction. Now, let me put that into a better perspective, right? The speed of light depends on the optical density of the medium, okay? As we saw there, we had air and water. Therefore, the light will travel with different speeds in different media. Now, let me make an example for you. We talked about water. 
all right? And we talked about air, but we can also have another medium, let's say glass, for example. The speed of light in air, right, is the one on the formula sheet, right? It is three. Air between water, air, and glass here, air has the fastest speed. Water, light is going to travel with 2,25 times 10 to the power 8. And you don't need to know these. I'm just putting it into a perspective for you. And then glass now is 2 times 10 to the power 8. So if we look at what is happening here, we can see that air is the fastest, followed by the water, right? And then the glass is the slowest. This is now the speed, because in the examination guideline, it said we must relate the speed to the densities. Now, when we compare the densities of these different media here, okay, A is the least. Spelling there. A is the least dense. Then comes water, and then it has glass, which is the most dense, right? So if we put it into order, we're basically saying that we move from air to water to glass. And what is happening with the speed? This is now the densities, and the densities you are putting order from least to most dense. When we speak about the speed, what can we observe here? We can see that in air, it's the fastest. In water, it's the second fastest. And in glass, it is the slowest. So in other words, what we are saying here, the relationship here that we are putting together is we are saying that the more dense it is, the slower it's going to move. And the least dense it is, the faster it's going to move. So that is also here showing you that when it's going from a less dense to a more dense, it is moving slower, therefore you have a smaller angle there. But when you go from water, which is more dense, to air, which is less dense, it is traveling much faster, therefore you have maximum refraction there. So look out for these because, I mean, we don't know what diagrams are coming. For example, they can give you this one and ask you to draw that, or they can give you this one and ask you to draw what will happen. So look out for the two um, media that you have and then it becomes very, very easy. So if it's water to air, you're going to have a big angle of refraction. But if it's air to water, you're going to have a small angle of refraction because it is traveling much, much slower. And you will understand this more when we go into um, the colors, because definitely um, there is a relationship between the speed and wavelength and all of that. Right. Now, if they do not ask you reflection, which is the bouncing off, and they don't ask you refraction, which will be like that, what is the third option in this topic? it is going to be critical angle. And most people, I don't know why they find this topic very, very hard, but it's not at all. Critical angle, I love the second definition. It says the angle of incidence in the optically dense medium for which the angle of refraction is 90. When I tell my students, they say, Ijo. Now let's put that into perspective, right? We are saying that the refraction will be 90 if there is a critical angle. Now, here's an image. This is a light ray, and this I see I'm using it to indicate critical angle. So we already know two topics so far. We know reflection and we know refraction. Now we are adding in critical angle. All critical angle is saying, critical angle is saying that if the incidence ray is less than this critical angle, whatever it is, let's make a hypothetical example of 48 degrees. Is this critical angle equal to 48 degrees? So if the incidence ray is less than that, which can be 30, 35, anything is less than that, 
then what is going to happen is you are going to have refraction. That is when the incident ray is falling incident on your surface where it is less than the critical angle because this critical angle allows us to either move below it or above it. So the moment we are below it, this section, you are going to have refraction. But when you are over the critical angle, right? So critical angle is 48. That means anything like 50, anything like 60, it really doesn't matter, anything above this. When it is now falling incident above your critical angle, then you are going to have total internal reflection. So this, I love this topic because it's merging two topics that we already know. So it's very, very easy. All we're saying that if you have your critical angle, if the angle is greater than your critical angle, it's going to reflect back into your surface. If it is less than your critical angle, it is then going to refract out. It's going to bend, basically. So it's going to bend, 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 bend until it eventually bends all the way out, and that is total internal reflection. So these, this topic merges three ideas. If it is less than the critical angle, it will refract out. If it is greater than your critical angle, it's going to totally reflect within the medium. Here it's glass and maybe there's air, so it will then reflect back. Examination guideline also says, that we need to know the uses of total internal reflection, right? But before I do the uses, I just want us to look at um, a beam of light. So here's a very good example, right? Here you've got your water and there's air. So that is air on top and you've got water here at the bottom. What phenomena is being displayed here? It's total internal reflection. So if total internal reflection is being displayed, that simply means that the critical angle has to be less than what is being displayed. So the critical angle, then what is going to happen? Let me just change to a brighter color um, to make it uh, easier for them to see. So what is going to happen if it is the critical angle? This is total internal reflection, which means it has exceeded the critical angle. So if it was a critical angle, maybe there, then it will go out at 90 degrees like that. That is when it's when the incident ray is exactly the angle of incidence is exactly equal to the critical angle. But if it is less than then what did I say? If it is less than sorry then it will refract outwards. So basically it will refract out and it is a larger or a less dense, so it will have a large angle of incidence. So guys, this is a beautiful topic. It's a lovely topic. This is total internal reflection. This one will be at the critical angle, so that means that a critical angle, if I can call it that, is equal to the angle of incidence. And then this one here is now refraction. And refraction is when the um, angle of incidence is less than, is less than the critical angle. Right, and that's all. Sometimes they give it in multiple choice with three diagrams, we don't know, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Where is this used? And always remember that your ray diagrams must have arrows on them, right? So not just straight lines, but rays of light. Where is this used? It's used in fiber optics. So for example, the internet, it is all totally reflected out from the source to the device. It's used in medicine, for example, if you want to examine the internal structure of a stomach, you will then swallow a camera and then um, you can observe that on a computer. If you want more simple examples, then here is an example of a periscope. So a periscope, like in the introduction of SpongeBob, for example, this is the land at the top because the submarine is underwater. 
So sometimes they want the Navy want to maybe check for pirates or whatever, because there's also a sea security. Everything that is observed from the land is going to be totally reflected onto this mirror and then to that mirror and then to the viewer who is at the bottom of the ocean. So these are just some of the uses. This is what they see on land, for example, and here is your observer. So they can look around. It's also binoculars. It's also a fish eye lens of a camera. So you just need to know maybe one or two examples they can ask you in multiple choice or to write them down. Right. So now when we speak about light, we must never ever forget or separate the fact that light is an part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here I've got ways in which you can remember them. So rabbits mate in very unusual, expensive gardens. That's where you find them with like the upper class people, which is radio, microwaves, infrared, visible light, which I'm gonna go into now, ultraviolet rays, X-rays and gamma rays, or another one, ripped men in violet underpants are extremely gorgeous. So however you use a rhyme to remember them is up to you, but do not forget that that visible light is part of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. So now let's look more into light because dispersion is now the next part of light. So what we are saying is that when we speak about visible light, it can be it can undergo dispersion, it can be dispersed, which means that it will break up into its component colors. These component colors, you need to know them all for by heart in the correct order. So now let's look more into that. When does dispersion take place? It takes place when white light passes through this glass prism. And then what happens is the examiner loves to give you this diagram. But what I want you to remember is this is actually what it's going to look like. Then it becomes so much easier to understand that red yeah, has your largest wavelength. And then this violet has the shortest wavelength because this is how you must actually remember it. So that part, visible light is part of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. It divides up into its component colors. Some people are remembering it like Roy G. Berth for the correct order, right? Now, the order in which these um, colors appear are not random. They happen because of how fast the speed, as well as the wavelength, as well as the frequency. All of these are components in the way in which we observe these colors of the rainbow. So let's now go more into it and see. If we look at the wavelength, yeah, the ones that are written here at the bottom, they are saying that violet is roughly. It's a range, it's not exactly, it's plus minus around 400 nanometers. And red is anything from 700 nanometers to 750. These are ranges. As you saw in the previous picture, it's not exact to say where does it end, the colors. You know, they are crossing over these numbers. So we just talk about a range. But nonetheless, the reason why these wavelengths become important to me is because People forget that wavelength is lambda and wavelength, when we use it in calculation, it must be in meters. Because of that, the examiner knows that these are very, very small numbers. They know that you are going to forget to convert. That's, I think, why they love asking conversions. So please remember that even for these colors, we must convert the nanometers to meters. And how do we do that? Nanograde 10 is 10 to the power negative nine. So this violet is actually having 400 times 10 to the power negative nine meters as its wavelength. And the red, if we take 700 as an example of a shade of red, it is 700 times 10 to the power negative nine meters. That is the wavelength of these colors. 
Now, why am I doing this? Because let's look at the exam question. Calculate the energy of a photon of light with a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Because we studied, we know that this is a red color and they're asking you to calculate the energy of a photon in that red ray. So what do you do, right? A photon, let's just recap, it is a quantum of energy. Right, let's pray they ask this tomorrow for two marks. They gave you wavelength, that is lambda, and they want you to calculate the energy of a photon. So from our formula sheet, you will go and look for the formula HC divided by lambda. H, where do you get it on your formula sheet? It is Planck's constant. Right, Planck's constant is on the formula sheet H, 6 times 6, 3 times 10 to the power negative 34. And C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the power 8. And we know that we have to convert. So we have the lambda, which is now 700 times 10 to the power negative 9 in meter. Then you substitute these values. You will notice for energy of a photon from all the past papers, the top is always the same because these are constants. So it will be 6 times 6, 3 times 10 to the power negative 34. Then it will always be now your speed of light because that is also a property of the electromagnetic spectrum. They all travel at that speed. And then you substitute comfortably your converted answer. And then you put it into your calculator. 6.63 times 10 to the power negative 34. And I don't know if everybody knows how to put their um, calculator in scientific notation, but that really, really helps for this topic as well as um, elasticity and those topics. So I will just write it for you now. I'm just doing the calculation, negative 34 multiplied by 3 times 10 to the power 8, positive, and then 700 times 10 to the power negative 9 as your denominator, and then your answer that you will have calculated will be 2,84 times 10 to the power negative 19 joules. Why joules? Because it is energy, and all energy is joules no matter if it's heat, no matter if it is kinetic energy, all of them have joules. Please don't forget that for tomorrow. Right, so this would now be the energy of a photon in the color red, for example. They can even uh, put it like that, calculate the energy of a photon in um, a red ray of light with a wavelength of 700 nanometers, and here you will easily get your marks, right? Now, we are moving on now um, from this calculation. I'm not Mr. Nambani that gives breaks because I try to cover a lot of content in a given time. So now let's look at um, the colors here, right? So here it's nanometers. What did we just learn? We learned that this is wavelength. OK, and always we are going to convert it using that if it's nanometers and if it's micrometer, it will be times 10 to the power negative six. Now, what I want you to understand here is the wavelength itself. So they're saying from here to there's one wave, that means here's a second wave and so on. Here it is a much longer wavelength, so you can see that violet has a higher frequency, more waves are passing in the same amount of time here. So red is much slower, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven waves, compared to here it's about 11 or 12. So all that I want you to also understand is that if we compare the energies, right, we are dividing by the wavelength, right? So what does that mean about violet? We just calculated red now and we got 2,84 times 10 to the power negative 19 joules. But if we now take this violet, let's quickly substitute it because we are practicing. Take this violet. This is always the same. 
from the formula sheet, no cramming required. And let's take that 400 as it is with our substitution, our conversion, sorry. And then when we put that into our calculator, because I want us to compare the energies using calculation, because then you can see it for yourself. I didn't make it up. I didn't cram it. I'm doing it by calculation. So in my calculator, I've put my Planck's constant. Then I've put the speed of light. And now my 400 times 10 to the power, negative 9. And what am I getting there? I'm getting 4,97 times 10 to the power, negative 19 joules. This was the energy of red, and that is the energy of a photon in violet. Now, what can we see? This is a larger number. They have the same. That is larger. So it means that when we are comparing the energies here, this one has high energy. This has low energy. All right. So red, if we are talking about red, we are saying it has low energy. What else? It has a long wavelength, right? And what else about it? Frequency, low frequency. Violet, what did we calculate? We calculated that it has low, sorry, high energy. What did we see here? It has a short wavelength. And what else? It has a high frequency. There are many waves passing there in the same time. All right. Then from the refraction part, what did we see also? Uh, let me just remove this part here. Right, what did we see also about this red and violet? We also saw that red has the least refraction. And this one has the most refraction. It obviously travels faster, therefore it can go for the distance. Right, so that is so amazing about these topics. I love merging topics. It becomes easier to understand and easier to remember things. So any photon of any electromagnetic wave, it doesn't matter. Light, visible light is also one of them. So you can also calculate it for this topic as well. Right, now I'm going to a second example, merging topics again. It says define photon of, of light. So we know already a quantum of energy. There we go, two marks are yours. Excellent. Now they didn't ask about visible light this time. They asked about radio waves. And now I brought this because I just love conversions. Mega is 10 to the power six. So it means now if you had to calculate the energy of any wave, here you are given the frequency this time. So previously we were using the wavelength. Now we're using the frequency. So I want us to look at this uh, formula here. So now E will be HF. F is frequency, H is still Planck's constant. Where do you get it? You get it from the formula sheet. Substitute 6 times 6, 3 times 6 to the power negative 34. Converted 102,5 times 10 to the power 6. All energy is joules. Then you substitute into your calculator. Guys, you must always practice your calculator. There's no point in staring at a question paper. You must put it, even if you are using a memo to study, some people use a memo. Do it yourself as well. So here you are going to get six comma. Uh, let me go for six, nine, six. Six, nine, six. And this one is times 10 to the power negative 26 joules. 
don't be afraid of these negative. Put your calculator in scientific notation. Um, that is, let me just write it here. Shift, then setup, then number seven, and then number four. I like number four because it will give you uh, four significant figures, so that will be easy to round off, and then it's going to put it in this form for you. This is two on your calculator. And it's not only for this topic, it's for elasticity and hydraulics and on those ones as well. All right, now where are we now? We are at the end of our examination guideline uh, here, which speaks about reflection, refraction, critical angle, dispersion of colors. We've spoken about the laws in terms of the angles being equal, refraction, they are not equal, the relationship between speed of light, the wavelength because of the densities. I've spoken about internal reflection and then the uses of um, internal reflecting prisms. The conditions obviously must have two optically different densities. Um, so that is also one of the conditions. Now I'm going to give you only 50 seconds. Uh, yes, 50 seconds to digest everything. And then we are moving on to lenses. Right, there we go. We have come back from our breather, 50 seconds of breathing. And now we are going into our beloved lenses um, that everybody loves so much, including myself. Right, lenses are absolutely amazing. If tomorrow they put lenses, those whole five marks are yours, quite easily done with no reason to panic or stress. Now, we have two lenses luckily for us. And how do you remember them? Hey, my students are saying it looks like an eye. For example, they're saying this one is like a cave, but for me, I want you to take it from converging lens is convex. It means that the rays come together, right? And then concave will be the other one, which is where they are going to diverge, all right? So a converging lens is convex. It's, yes, it's for the eyes, if you want to put it that way, but they are very, very easy. Now, in that black book, page 61, they are giving you a table like this. Lovely for people that like memorizing, but there's no need to even memorize the nature of an image if you know how to draw the ray diagram. The applications, yes, you can like merge them to say, oh, this is for a camera photocopy machine because it's exactly the same image. A projector is enlarging your teacher screen to that screen. Um, there's no image form, so it's like a lighthouse. You know, you can do that for yourself. But one thing that these diagrams, obviously this is different, right? One thing that these diagrams have in common that is where I want to start. They all have a line. Let me rather do it on this side. Hey, my lens is now not so great. But they all have a line that goes to the middle of the lens. Right? So here is it here. There is it there. There is it over there. And there is it over there. Right? 
So every single one of these options, whether it's placed, whether the object is beyond 2F, on 2F, on F, it doesn't matter. You can see here they all have this green line here. Where's the green line going? It's going to the mid, the middle of this, and you must draw it with the dotted line, right? Then if you check the next thing they all have in common is that all of them are passing through F. I don't know if you are studying this way. All of them go from that middle point through F. Just check it. All of them are going through the first focal. All right. That is the second thing they have in common. What is the third thing they have in common? Let me use brown. They are all having a ray, right? That is going through your optical center. Actually, a good practice is here to actually put O there when you're drawing. So all of them are going through that point there, right? All of them are going through that point. So in other words, what we are saying is, wherever the object is placed, doesn't matter where it's placed, right? Any of these options here, any of these options. Wherever that object is placed, what you need to do for your marks is to obviously draw your, there will be a lens or you can draw your lens is to go to the middle of the lens, right? The middle of the lens. From the middle of the lens, you need to go through the first F. I'll put a line now. I'm just trying to make this for you like understandable. The second one is that it must pass through this point, right? So it's going to pass there. It doesn't matter where it's placed. Now, the fourth thing you need to identify is where the lines converge, cross over, is where your image is going to be formed. So over here, over here, over here, here, it's like this example, it does not converge. Therefore, no image is formed because the image is formed where they are crossing. So here is it formed, here is it formed, here is it formed. Here it's not formed, right? And then the magnifying glass is the only one that is different because it has its uh, image on the opposite side, like totally opposite, which is fine. These are exceptions to the norm, which you can really go and look at them. But all the others, I shame, these five marks are a guarantee. Let's check now. What am I actually saying? The next one is an exam question. It says, in that black book, I got it from there. The diagram below shows the formation of an image when rays of light pass through an unknown lens. The object, the image, the optical center, and the principal axis are indicated. Object, image, principal axis, your optical center, which you can also put O there, it's not a problem, are all indicated. Redraw the diagram in your answer book and indicate all the rays and the correct type of lens for five marks. Lovely. Very lovely. We know that the first thing we need to do is we can put that dotted line there for the midpoint of the lens. No problem. Then you put your lens. Lovely. Then what have I told you? You put those lines there for these five marks from the top of the object, or oh, sorry, let me use a solid line, top of the object to your midpoint, lovely. From there, it goes through F, lovely. And then the next line, let me change its 
Well, let me keep it the same color. The next one goes from the top way through that center corner. Done. What is short? Rays of light. Change it from lines to rays. Wow, 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 wow. We must pray that tomorrow really such is for us. So it doesn't matter, even if they put it here, same operation, even if they move it from there to there, same operation. Look, it won't always be given to you like this, right? Where you have a diagram to draw on or an example, basically an example or a clue. It might be given to you in a different way, right? And that different way is where the question actually specifies it, like an object is placed in front of a converging lens. Converse, converging lens is easy. You know that it's going to be that one, okay? Then they tell you, draw a ray diagram to indicate the position and size of the image formed when the object is placed between the focal point, which is F and 2F, use an arrow to represent the object, okay? So if we just go back quickly to discuss the image itself, you see why I say you don't have to study because you can see the object is this high or this tall, but this image is a, is a lot smaller, right? So that is a property. It is smaller. Is it upright? This is upright. No, it's inverted. And all of this converging lenses have your real images. So you don't even have to study any properties like the next, the second question, where should the object be placed so that it's real inverted and the same size? If it's the same size, it's a photocopy machine. So it means that the object must be placed on 2F always. You study that table. So here for the five marks now, they are really giving you work to do, which is nice because you can relax in that time, stop stressing in the exam. So you start there with your principal axis. Then next thing, there we go. Then if it was me, I would now start with my lens. Not good at drawing on uh, the pad, this kind of shape, but I try my best. Now, in this situation, you must remember that these must be equal distance. So if you choose two centimeter, for example, all of them must then be two centimeter on both sides, two centimeter, two centimeter. Yes, you must use a ruler. So this will be F and F, it's like a number line, and then two F, right, like that. Ah, two F, and there's also three F, yes, the next one, okay. Now, where did they say you must put it between F and 2F? And they said, please use an arrow. So it must be between, yeah, that's fine. And then now, our lines, first lines, and then we convert them, right? We convert them after. We convert them after. So between 2F and F, you still go there straight. There we go. Then this one goes through F, 100%. And then the next one goes through your center. Okay, it won't be 100% accurate. Do you know why? Because I did not use a ruler. Did not use a ruler, right? So essentially, this one should actually form beyond 2F, but it's fine because I did not use a ruler and I don't want to crook the books, but this is what is actually going to happen over there. I think that second one is a problem. Oh, let me remember, just delete it. So that is the problem. I did not use a ruler. If I did use a ruler, I would get it exactly. Now, if that is my drawing for five marks, will I get five marks? No, I will get zero because I did not put, convert them from lines to rays. And that is legitimately 
how Mr. Nambani expects you to draw this diagram. Please represent the free state well if they ask this kind of question because it's very easy. Go from the arrow straight to the middle, down the first F and through the center and where they merge, converge, you have your image. So the second question says, where must the object be placed so that it's real inverted and same size? So it must be on 2F and then it's going to form on 2F as well. Right, so you can go and study that table, but I think now it's very, very obvious. Right, so now this is our final slide of this presentation. And no, we are not doing this topic. I specified the calculation, but we have done this calculation, even though I've done light, because it's also part of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, right? Um, we've described the photon as a quantum of energy. Excellent. We have not really discussed the frequency and the wavelength, but you can study them. We've arranged them in order from those rhymes and you will get this PDF. And then the only thing that you need to self-study is the uses of the UV light, gamma rays um, and X-rays, etc. And then also just make sure about your conversions here, conversions of wavelength. And these are on the formula sheet, so you do not have to stress. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of our presentation. And we wish you the absolute best tomorrow. Don't panic. Read your questions. Highlight the variables. Highlight the magnitudes. Always check for your conversions first in any topic. Put your calculator in scientific notation for um, light, elasticity, even hydraulics, and then clear and reset it for all your other topics. Also remember you can start in any order and make sure that your question is on a new page. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and may the Lord abundantly bless you in your studies today, tomorrow and Sunday. Thank you so much, Mr. Nambani, over to you.